good evening uh, sir second uh, sorry for the inconveniences uh, i request jayinder uh, to introduce uh, madam once again because just now started live sorry uh, people who are new in the zoom and this things okay. we are live now sir yeah just now live so can you introduce uh, once again yeah. Yeah. madam and uh, Yes, and please. Uh, we are beginning with the first case. So first case is a case of congenital hypothyroidism and it will be presented by Dr. Pooja Soni. She is a postgraduate student, uh, third year postgraduate student at Ames Bhopal and she has been guided by Dr. Mahesh Maheswari and Dr. Deep Sikha. Uh, the Dr. Deep Sikha is a senior resident at Ames Bhopal and Dr. Mahesh Maheswari is professor and in charge pediatric endocrine services at Ames Bhopal and he is uh, an active academician and involved in various IFP activities and uh, other uh, academic events. And the examiner for the first case is Professor Vandana Jain. She is uh, in charge of pediatric endocrinology at uh, Ames Delhi. And ma'am is uh, actively involved in academic uh, and uh, teaching uh, for last 15, 20, uh, 15 year, years. And uh, she has many publications and book chapters under her name. So we are beginning with the first case of congenital hypothyroidism. Dr. Pooja, can we start? Uh, good evening, all. Yeah, Ria, uh, can you make uh, Pooja host, please? She's unable to share. Yes, yes, it's done, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm not able to share the screen, sir. It's showing host as disabled participant screen sharing. Ria, share screen, karna hai. Host banana. You can tell the history till then, or... Yes, Good evening, respected teachers. Uh, sir, my, is my screen is visible, sir? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, it is visible. Uh, good Go evening, ahead. more. I'm, today, I'm going to present this case. So, four months old female child. Resident of Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, belonging to upper middle class, he presented with complaints of inadequate weight gain since birth, and she has not achieved age appropriate milestone according to parents. The increased letharginess for last 15 days, an increased progress, uh, progressive pallor for which she has received blood transfusion 15 days back. In detailed history, she was a late preterm born uh, at uh, 36 weeks. Uh, she was a very low birth weight baby born at uh, 1000 grams of birth weight, born to a 30 years old mother with gestational hypertension, which was controlled on medication. And after delivery, she cried immediately after birth. And she had an NIC stay of 10 days in view of prematurity, very low birth weight, respiratory distress syndrome for which she required oxygen support for one day and hyperbilirubinemia for which phototherapy required for three to four days. She was discharged on day of life 10 with weight of 1.25 kilograms. After discharge, child was apparently well, but was not gaining adequate weight and developmental milestones were, uh, she didn't uh, gain developmental milestone as compared to the elder siblings. But there was, uh, but parents did not seek any medical consultation for them and no screening test was performed. At four months of age, the child came to Ames uh, in view of inadequate weight gain and since she has gained only uh, five, 250 uh, grams. Hello. hello. Yes, sir. Go ahead, go ahead. 
she presented at four months of age with complaints of inadequate weight gain since she has gained only 250 grams in last four months from 1.25 to 1.5 kg and delay in development since child was not able to hold her neck or she was not uh, uh, smiling and increased letharginess for last 15 days and progressive pallor for which she received one blood transfusion from outside there was no history of cough cold fast breathing vomiting loose stools or crying while urination or feed intolerance there was no history of constipation or tb contact there was no history of abnormal body movement or staring look no history of forehead sweating while feeding or suckers suck cycle there was no history of abdominal distension or skin rash on developmental history in gross motor milestone she on supine sitting posture she, uh, there was uh, no neck holding and she was uh, she, on sitting posture she was sitting with rounded back on pull to sit maneuver there was complete head leg on ventral suspension she was able to lift head momentarily on prone suspension prone positioning uh, there was partial extension of hips and knees and she was able to lift her chin momentarily on vertical suspension stepping reflex was present on fine motor milestones grasp reflex is present in social adaptive and language milestones she was able to follow dangling object up to 90 degrees and she was alert to sound social smile was absent hence the developmental quotient for uh, her corrected age was 33% and developmental age is 1 month in family history she is the second born child born of non consanguineous males there is history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes mellitus and paternal grandfather and he was on his control on medication maternal aunt has hyperthyroidism which is also controlled on medication there was no history of similar illness in family or any history of sudden infant that any stillbirth or tb contact the child was unvaccinated till now and bcg score is absent on nutritional history she received express breast milk feeding and mother uh, was uh, mother quantified it like uh, 400 to 450 ml per day she was not on any supplements she was receiving a uh, total 290 kilocalories approx 290 kilocalories of energy per day against her uh, recommended intake of 500 kilocalories that is deficit of 42% and she was receiving 5 grams of protein per day against 6.9 grams of rda that is deficit of 27% on exam on anthropometry the current weight is 1.5 kg the median weight for her age is 5.8 kg that is coming below minus 3 standard deviation her length is 40 cm and the median for this age is 59.8 cm that is also below minus 3 standard deviation so this type of severe malnutrition her head circumference was 31 cm against a median of 39.5 cm that is also minus below minus 3 standard deviation suggestive of microcephaly and she has gained 500 grams uh, weight in last 4 months 3 cm of length in last 4 months and 1 cm so gain in head circumference on general physical examination child was awake but lethargic vitals for heart rate was 108 per minute it was regular respiratory rate is 46 per minute that is abdominal thoracic type regular with normal depth spo2 is 98% on room air capillary filling time is below 3 second less than 3 second temperature is 98.4 degree fahrenheit and blood pressure was 78 by 50 mm of mercury on head trip examination the head uh, shape of head is head is normal hairs were normal anterior fontanelle is open and it is of 4 into 3 4 by 3 cm pulsatile at level posterior fontanelle was normal uh, was open and it was of 2 by 1 cm she was having a uh, coarse feature facial features at birth she was uh, having uh, these were the facial features at uh, birth and at 4 months of age she has developed some broadening of nasal base and uh, protrusion of tongue with large tongue and some coarse facial feature oral cavity examination was normal there was no abnormal mass was able to detect hearing was normal she was alert to sound on neck examination there was no palpable mass the skin and nails were normal there was no pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy or edema genitalia were normal coming to systemic examination 
on central nervous system examination hi she was awake but cry was weak and physical activity was reduced cranial nerve examination was normal on motor examination tone was reduced in all four limbs power was 4 by 5 in all limbs deep tendon reflexes are 1 plus and superficial reflexes were normal plantars were violator extensor in neonatal reflexes uh, primitive reflexes molars reflex was absent tonic neck reflex was present and stepping reflex was present sensory system examination was normal and there was no cerebral size there was no uh, nystagmus visible on prior abdomen examination abdomen was soft and there was no significant uh, finding in uh, other system examination abdomen was soft and non tender there was no palpable organomegaly on uh, cardiovascular system examination s1 s2 was heard and there was no audible murmur on respiratory system examination bilateral air entry was e present and equal and there was no edit sound Coming to the summary of my case, it is a preterm, 36 week old born child, very low birth weight, with birth weight of 1,000 grams. Second born female child with an IC stay of 10 days in view of low birth weight, respiratory distress syndrome, and neonatal hyperbilirubinemia requiring phototherapy. With current chronological age of four months and corrected gestational age of three months, she was an unvaccinated child with global developmental delay. With presented with poor weight gain since birth and increased letharginess for last fifteen days with progressive pallor requiring one elicate of blood transfusion from outside. On examination, child was having severe malnutrition and microcephaly with large protruded tongue, coarse facial features, open posterior fontanel, generalized hypotonia and hyperreflexia. With these findings, our differential diagnosis were hypothyroidism. Congenital infections like torch infection or tuberculosis, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and metabolic disorders. Points in favor of hypothyroidism were she was having developmental delay in letharginess and failure to type. She was having large protruded tongue with coarse facial features. She was uh, anemic. She was having pallor. She was having wide fontanel and uh, wide uh, anterior fontanel and open posterior fontanel and she was having hypotonia hyperreflexia the points against the hypothyroidism were that she was there was no history of constipation or prolonged jaundice and on examination there was no dry skin or umbilical hernia the points against uh, points in fa favor of congenital infections were developmental delay letharginess and microcephaly and points against congenital infections were there was no history of hearing defect or skin rashes jaundice respiratory distress or on examination there was no organomegaly or cardiac involvement points in favor of hypoxic systemic encephalopathy were gestational hyper that she uh, mother was having gestational hypertension and this was a premature and iugr child but developmental delay failure to type and hypotonia and points against hypoxic systemic encephalopathy was there was no history of birth asphyxia or seizures points in favor of metabolic disorder were like uh, this child was having developmental delay letharginess and she was failure to type and she was having microcephaly but point against metabolic disorder were there was no feed intolerance and there was no organomegaly so we uh, went ahead with investigations cbc lft rft were uh, normal she was having uh, hemoglobin of 12 with total leukocyte count of 7450 and platelet count of 4.69 lakhs with normal differential counts urea creatinine was 12 and 0.31 mg per deciliter electrolytes were sodium was 138 mm per liter potassium was 3.9 and chloride was 102 mm per liter Uh, total bilirubin was 0.8 mg per deciliter with direct fraction of 0.1 mg per deciliter and indirect fraction of 0.7 mg per deciliter stlt were 25 and 15 units per liter total protein was 6.9 g per deciliter and albumin was 3.8 g per deciliter lp was 125 and ggt was 22 units per liter on further evaluation the arterial blood gas was done which showed normal parameters and urine ph was also normal on thyroid function test she was having tsh of more than 150 micro units in per ml with free t4 levels of 0.6 nanogram per deciliter her gastric aspirate for a b and c b net was sent twice and it came negative torch profile was negative and transfrontal leucocyte was also normal so in view of history of developmental delay With letharginess, with examination findings showing failure to type, 
large protruded tongue, cause facial features, anemia, open posterior fontanel, hypotonia, and investigations showing high TSH with low free T4. Our diagnosis, we made a diagnosis of congenital hypothyroidism. For further localization and further assessment, USG of neck was done in which there was no visualized uh, thyroid gland in neck or oropharyngeal region. Further, we went ahead with thyroid scan in which there was no visualization of any thyroid tissue in normal thyroid bed or elsewhere in neck or mediastinum. Hence, diagnosis of thyroid agenesis was made and child was started on thyroxine supplementation at dose of 15 microgram per kilogram per day. And this child gained one kilogram weight in next two and a half months and developmental milestones also improved. Currently, the child is of three years of age and currently anthropometry and developmental milestones are appropriate for age. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Vandana Madam yeah. to proceed further and ask any questions. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So, Pooja, uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so in this case, this baby was uh, extremely low birth weight preterm baby. So uh, in your case, I think newborn screening was not done. But suppose it was done. Could you have still missed this baby on newborn screening? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in this case, this was a premature child. So mm -hmm. in premature child, there is a late, uh, there is late uh, surge of TSH. So mm -hmm. if we uh, if we do this, uh, if we do at the for, uh, regular TSH screening at uh, after seventy two hours, we can miss uh, we can miss our diagnosis. Like we need to repeat it after three weeks. Yeah. So that is one very important point. The other thing is that you found microcephaly in this child and very severe developmental delay. So, uh, can you tell us the reason why it happened? Why did the baby have so much of microcephaly? How does thyroid impact the brain, brain development? Ma'am, this child was a preterm and IUGR child born and mother was also having gestational hypertension. So, this might be one reason behind this uh, severe microcephaly. And the uh, thyroid... Sorry, yes, ma'am. Please continue. Yes, ma'am. And uh, the... Uh, another thing, thyroid is thyroid hormone is in, is uh, required for the normal growth of neuron, normal growth and proliferation, differentiation of neurons for uh, brain normal brain development in the fetal and early neuron, uh, infantile age. Yes, so that is very important. That basically for for everything for neuronal development, migration, synaptogenesis, for glial cell development and differentiation, for everything, thyroid uh, hormone thyroxine is required. So definitely it can cause microcephaly, although typically it is uh, like not described as one of the features. We typically see uh, open AF, PF and uh, developmental delays. Microcephaly is not typically described. Maybe the other features like IUGR and prematurity was also contributing. Okay, so I think you made a good presentation. So um, Dr. Amana, can we move to the talk? Yeah, ma'am, if there are no questions, then we could get that. Can you look at the chat and see if there are questions? Can hmm. we ask? Uh, there are no yeah. questions in the chat, ma'am. Can this I question... ask any questions? Yeah, Dr. Ramit, uh, sir, you want to ask questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. Just a second, sir. Dr. Ravindra, sir, uh, is the in charge of uh, pediatric endocrinology and neonatology at uh, Municipal Hospital and uh, Indura Hospital, North Delhi. Welcome you, sir. Sir is uh, also an examiner. And uh, we request you to ask all the questions relating to pediatric, just like a final exam. Not only hypothyroidism, any case, anything you can ask. Open for discussion and other people can answer your uh, questions in chat box. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amarnath. And first of all, very uh, interesting case and uh, very good case, Dr. Pooja. However, I mean, uh, I am surprised this baby was discharged at the 1.25 kg. From where it was discharged? Because it's not a policy to discharge a baby with just 1.25 kg. 
it was a hospital delivery must be a premature delivery and then it was discharged from a hospital because baby was has been treated at some hospital and because baby was having couple of complications for example unital hyperbill so how uh, baby was discharged at the 1.25 kg weight it's it's a pretty you know too low weight to discharge uh, yes sir definitely sir thank you for the question but uh, this child was born in the outside hospital and she was discharged on day of life 10 with the birth weight of, with the uh, weight of 1.25 kg kilograms so do you think it was right to discharge at 1.25 kg uh, no sir it was not an appropriate uh, weight for so discharge what, what in your opinion should be the appropriate weight when baby a premature baby should be discharged uh, sir premature baby can be discharged by a uh, weight of 1.8 to 2 kg like uh, when she, uh, uh, second question is there is a history of mtp in second third and fourth delivery why it is so uh so it uh, mother didn't want to uh, uh mother didn't want to uh, progress uh, progress this uh, conception so she went with mtp so there must be something more than that she got three abortions and after then still she is having fifth time she is opting for a baby so there has to be something for that uh there was no uh, exactly reason sir the mother didn't want to continue the pregnancy and that's why she decided to abort i think you you must you know grill mother more uh, this uh, history is uh, slightly uh, unlikely i mean mother is having three abortion and then one fifth one something is there can you find any reason for iugr have they taken antenatal care because one kg baby at 36 of uh, 36 weeks of gestation it's a severe you know sga baby obviously must be having many complications one of them may be microcephaly so what was the reason of Uh, such iogr have they taken antenatal care uh, sir mother was having gestational hypertension also so that But might also be one as you have written with medicines i'm sorry sorry sir pardon sir you have written that with medicine the this gestational hypertension was well controlled ha yes sir but uh, in the initial like first trimester mother didn't uh, received adequate nutrition also so that uh, might also be even has been investigated she has gone some antenatal ultrasound scan to know why such a severe iugr she at 36 weeks she went uh, uh, she went for ultrasound in her last, last trimester at that time only she was told that uh, she is having a small baby as a Uh, against the gestational age okay okay and why she was giving express milk rather than the breast milk because this child was uh, not able to suck properly sir also the child was uh, only 1.25 kg when she was uh, discharged when she was not able to suck properly so that's why mother was giving her express breast milk you said baby cried immediately after birth but still you kept the diagnosis of hie Uh, so sir that was one of the differential diagnosis because uh, this was a premature child and mother was having gestational hypertension so still there was a antenatal event can also cause hie hypoxic and ischemic that would have been presented at birth baby would not be crying have uh, abgar score was available no sir uh, it was not available for us so we were not sure have you done the knee x ray of this baby uh, no sir could it be any difference of getting an x ray or is it indicated or it is of no relevance so to puja i hope i am not very uh, you know these are simple question i don't think i am going to be no no i think i think you can you can continue she is having a answer of almost all the things <laughs> yeah yeah that is robert i, I I'm having a pressure problem. So, and so Pooja, is there any role of any doing any X-ray in congenital hypothyroidism? So, this what uh, Dr. Ravindra is asking. Okay, yeah, Dr. Pooja. Pooja, are you here? Yes, sir. Ah, so is there any role? Yeah, you are doing great. Okay, we'll get in congenital hypothyroidism. Yeah, Disha, yeah, you can also answer. Other postgraduates who are there, they are also can answer yeah. if they want. They can put in, uh, I think, chat box. 
because they can't yeah, write other it. people can uh, answer in chat box anyway any x-ray is a very good um, uh, whenever you are thinking of congenital hypothyroidism because then epiphysis is seen epiphysis will be absent and you might be thinking that probably it's a case of severe hypothyroidism and then you treat on a higher dose as you have very rightly done that you uh, did with started the treatment with 15 microgram per kg body weight i know there is a, a 10 to 15 at any way you can start thank you dr pooja really nice interesting case thank you so uh, ma'am there is a one question in the chat box uh, so they have asked if we are starting with a dose of 15 microgram per kg at 3 months then we have to continue with the same dose or so we have to taper the dose and if we want to taper at what rate we should taper the dose of thyroxine so pooja will be answering or do you want me to answer so uh, pooja can you answer this question so how to do the tapering and how to do the follow up actually this what uh, the question is yeah how to do the follow up in these scenarios uh sir in the uh, in the initial in the for the congenital hypothyroidism at the beginning when we start the thyroxine then initially we uh, first of all we do repeat uh, the thyroid function test after 2 2 to 3 weeks and then uh, for, uh, for for follow up in the infantile is we repeat the uh, thyroid levels uh, tsh and t4 free t4 levels every uh, two week twice a month twice a month and after that we can do it uh, every 2 to 3 months yeah pooja here question is different please understand the question do you want to stop all the cases of congenital hypothyroidism at the age of 3 years or not first question second if you want to stop who will you stop after the age of 3 years so first thing is we need to differentiate we need to find out that whether it is a transient hypothyroidism or it is a uh, primary permanent hypothyroidism so if it is transient hypothyroidism then we can stop it but uh, if it is uh, permanent hypothyroidism then we need to continue like uh, but we can taper the dose so i think uh, i'll just like to add here pooja that basically you won't know whether it is transient or permanent one way of knowing is is that if your dose requirement goes down so initially of course you start with 15 microgram per kg and that is the answer to that question also but obviously you don't continue with the same dose because as the child grows older the dose requirement in terms of microgram per kg it goes down so typically in fact uh, even if you start with 37.5 or 50 the child would continue to require the same dose uh, and per kg dose would actually go down and most uh, you know investigators would say or authors would say that if your dose requirement is less than 2 microgram per kg then that is an indication that most likely the baby was having transient congenital hypothyroidism and you can give a trial of treatment or in uh, cases where you had not investigated properly initially a nuclear scan was not done or you had started it on dubious grounds borderline tsh elevation then you should give a trial of treatment at 3 uh, years of age so uh, one more question is there if even if we start the treatment at the age of 4 months will there be any development or delay or mental retardation dr pooja you can answer this so if the therapy is started at the age of 4 months will there be any developmental delay or intellectual disability in the child uh, uh, so some uh, some uh, amount like some amount of uh, uh, mental retardation or can be there but uh, if we start as early as possible then uh, the severity of the mental retardation will be uh, less for the age so thyroxine is, is uh, what, what is the preferred age to start the treatment how early you should start uh, it should be started as early as possible as well and within uh, one month of age so uh, it should be started within two weeks uh, of life so that's why the newborn screening has a role in congenital hypothyroidism so we want to screen all children we want to detect it early and we want to start the treatment as early as possible preferably within two weeks of life it should be started Yeah, Jayvinder. Just I want to add for the first question. There is no need to stop 
uh, hypothyroidism treatment if etiology is worked up very properly like in case of agenesis you have worked the up the ultrasound thyroid absent thyroglobin level you have done absent and also technician maintenance scan ectopic thyroid you know so where the chances are there like uh, you are taking the technician scan it is showing the uptake but uh, actually ultrasound discrepancy is there or even disharmonies in some cases we don't want to stop in all the cases where the uh, the doubt is there then you can stop so where the high level of tsh is there and my professor used to say you have to do dilution technique tsh may go up to 3000 Uh, 2000 like that it's the best way to practice to know the tsh uh, in the beginning thank you <clears throat> so dr amar there are no more to, questions yeah i want to add uh, uh, yes sir yes yes that uh, this is a common situation especially in preterm infants the neonatologists are very busy treating the prematurity and newborn screening is always forgotten quite often and uh, such babies as already said should have uh, screening at the age of 2 weeks or 3 weeks and should not be forgotten and uh, the in that case we can avoid developmental delay altogether like anybody else and i would also like to know the socio economic status of this uh, family because uh, i mean not that it matters even educated people can sometimes make mistakes and in this case who is to blame is it the parents the way puja was mentioning it looks like she is blaming the parents but why not the doctors the parents also i mean the the doctors also share equal responsibility and one more thing i want to say is parental education they should be given a talk about the usefulness of thyroid and uh, a genesis means lifelong treatment the parents should be educated that's also very very important and uh, we must remember all their questions should be answered and the lifelong treatment should be insisted on and as already amarna has said because diagnosis is already proved there is no need to do stopping the uh, treatment at 3 years and it's done only in cases where the where the uh, diagnosis is in doubt and uh, have you put my slides on yes sir your slides uh, these are the classical cases and there is no point diagnosing at this stage Because yes definitely there will be some developmental delay and even growth delay and uh, we may be happy making this diagnosis but uh, it is uh, not really required uh, i mean this uh, situation can be avoided if newborn screening is done okay my slides are different yes What sir I thank you to show today i'll show it later yes sir over to madam uh, i request madam to continue with the congenital hypothyroidism lecture thank you madam madam is a professor of pediatric endo endocrinology from all india institute of medical sciences has many publications and lot of work in uh, done she has done in congenital hypothyroidism thank you madam okay thank you um really it's a very good initiative by ispe i i really look forward to more and more participation from the post graduates for uh, this pep so um i hope my slides are visible yes madam visible okay. yeah so uh, pooja has already introduced the topic and everybody has uh, given their very valuable input so i'll be quick about this topic so congenital hypothyroidism as we know it is the commonest preventable cause of mental retardation and worldwide incidence is 1 in 3 to 4000 live births but in indian studies the incidence is even higher ranging from 1 in 1100 to 3 3400 live births coming to embryological development uh, the importance of thyroid gland is you know justified by the very fact that it is the first endocrine gland in the body to develop it develops as an outpouching of the endodermal epithelial cells from the foregut 
that is pharynx at foramen cecum at third to fourth week of gestation as early as third to fourth week and then it migrates to the thyroid bed by about seven to eight weeks and this path of migration is the tract of the thyroglossal duct and uh, this migration can lead to some developmental anomalies most importantly thyroglossal cysts and also ectopic thyroid and hypoplasia or agenesis this uh, picture here shows a child with ectopic uh, thyroid gland fetal physiology the synthesis and secretion of t4 and t3 also start from as early as 12 weeks of gestation however the hpt axis is not well developed and uh, fetal tsh trh they are very low until 18 to 20 weeks and therefore the fetus depends on the transplacental passage till then but uh, what is conveyed from the placenta uh, we'll come to it in the next slide so thyroid hormones they influence all aspects of cns development in hypothyroid fetuses because of transplacental passage of thyroid hormones and also increased conversion of t4 to t3 t3 is the active hormone please remember that the the major hormone which is secreted by the gland is t4 but it is converted peripherally into T3, and this T3 is the is the is the bioactive hormone. So this there is increased conversion in fetal brain by type 2 dehydrogenase. So therefore, there is neuroprotection. Sorry. However, in severe iodine deficiency, so both maternal as well as fetal uh, synthesis of thyroid hormone is compromised, and that is why these babies have neurointellectual impairment. So this slide is showing the interaction of mother, placenta, and fetus. Remember, placenta also has a very important role in pregnancy. So placenta secretes increased estrogen. There is HCG. HCG acts as LH, uh, and LH, as we know, which will act as TSH. So this will also increase. Uh, uh, this will cause increase in T4 production in the mother and reduce the TSH. And also, this estrogen causes increased TBG in the mother. This leads to increased total T4 and T3 in the mother. Uh, this HCG also actually goes to the fetus and there also it will uh, act by stimulating the thyroid gland. Placental TRH as well as maternal TRH, they easily cross the pl placenta and reach the fetus. Maternal TSH does not cross the placenta. T4 and T3 cross the placenta, but not in entirety. So um, a large uh, proportion of the T4, which is trying to cross the placenta is actually deiodinated into the inactive form here. So only a small proportion crosses, not the entire thing. And that is why the peripheral conversion of this T4 to T3 in the fetal brain, that is also very, very important for neuroprotection. Coming to thyroid hormone synthesis, iodide is the, is the main thing which is required for thyro, thyroxine synthesis. It constitutes 65% weight by weight of the thyroxine hormone. So uh, this trapping of uh, uh, iodide, iodide and then converting it into iodine. This is these are the most important steps. So for for the uh, trapping, it requires the sodium iodide symporter, and then uh, this is present in the basal membrane of the thyroid follicular cell. Look, this is the thyroid follicular cell. This is the colloid in between, and this is blood. So from the blood, iodine go, iodide goes inside. Then at the apical uh, membrane, there is another channel which is pendrin through which it goes into the colloid where thyroglobulin is already present. Thyroglobulin is also synthesized in the thyroid follicular cell and then uh, uh, secreted into the colloid. And this, then in this uh, thyroglobulin, there is iodination of the tyrosine residues. And then these are again endocytosed and then finally released into the circulation. And as I told you, thyroxine constitutes the most important hormone which is secreted, but then it is peripherally converted into uh, T3 as well. And for all of these actually steps to be become to become active, binding of TSH to TSH receptor. TSH receptor is also present on the basal, uh, basal membrane. So that binding is also very important. So physiological changes in TFT during pregnancy. So as I told you, there is increased uh, total T4 and T3 level and low TSH. Why is TSH lowest in first trimester? Because HCG is highest. So HCG is acting like TSH, it is causing increase in total T4 and T3, but, and this increase in total T4 and T3 are leading to feedback inhibition. So TSH is, what is the importance of this? That uh, TSH cutoff values are supposed to be lower for diagnosis of hypothyroidism in pregnancy. In first trimester, if maternal TSH is more than 2.5, and if it is more than three in the second and third trimester, then this mother is should be considered as, a, as likely to be having hypothyroidism. 
then perinatal changes in thyroid function so we are all familiar that very uh, soon after birth so within 30 to 60 minutes after birth um, there is a rise in tsh and this rise is very phenomenal rising to as high as 60 to 80 micro unit per ml and then there is a quick fall also quick fall falls to about 20 micro unit uh, milli unit per liter in the first 24 hours and then further decreases to less than 10 by the end of first week why does this happen? Because of intrapartum stress and the cold uh, extrauterine environment. What happens to T3 and T4? They also show a rise and then a fall. But the fall in T4 level is more gradual. And uh, uh, this decline occurs over four to five weeks. In preterm infants, this uh, there is a similar response, but this is blunted. And that is why they don't have as high TSH in the, in the perinatal period as the term babies. So coming to etiology of congenital hypothyroidism, it can be permanent or transient. Uh, permanent, the most important causes are thyroid dysgenesis, which constitute aplasia, hypoplasia, or ectopia, thyroid hormone biosynthetic defects or dyshormonogenesis, iodine deficiency, that is endemic cretinism, and hypothalamic pituitary hypothyroidism. So dysgenesis is the commonest cause. It affects about 1 in 4,000 live births and accounts for about 75 to 80% of all cases of congenital hypothyroidism. With agenesis accounting for approximately a third of these cases, rest are contributed by ectopia plus minus hypoplasia. The ectopic gland uh, may or may not be hypoplastic, it is usually hypoplastic. It is, uh, like, it is like a normal thyroid gland, but it is because it is hypoplastic, so gradually the function goes down. In some children right at birth, they may have congenital hypothyroidism. In some, actually, the initial levels may not be very much uh, affected. They may be missed or they may be considered as subclinical hypothyroidism, but gradually the thyroid function may go down. So uh, it's not that all ectopic would present right at birth. Sometimes they may present with hypothyroidism later as well. So thyroid dysgenesis is typically sporadic. So it is not familial. It is typically sporadic. There is a two, two is to one female to male preponderance. There are some genes which are implicated, but they are responsible in a minority because as uh, seen in many twin studies, in monozygotic twins also, there is a very poor concordance of congenital hypothyroidism due to dysgenesis. Coming to dyshormonogenesis. So we've already seen this figure. So there can be mutations in any of these pathways. Uh, like this sodium iodide symporter, it is uh, um, encoded by SLC5A5 gene. So mutation in this gene can cause uh, defect in thyroid trapping function. Then pendrin, we are all aware of this pendrin. So there is a pendrite syndrome in which there is congenital hypothyroidism with sensory neural hearing loss. But the same uh, pendrin gene encodes for this channel. And uh, this is present in the ear as well and kidney also. Then the most uh, important defect is defect in uh, thyroid peroxidase. So this is the commonest, commonest cause for dyshormonogenesis. So dyshormonogenesis has been like classically taught as being re responsible for 10 to 15% of all cases and mostly autosomal recessive with goitrous hypothyroidism. However, these things are now changing. Now recent papers suggest that probably they can be responsible for up to 30% of all cases and uh, need not be always autosomal recessive. For example, mutations in uh, duox T2 or, or duox A2 gene with autosomal dominant uh, presentation also, sometimes they may present with uh, hypothyroidism. Again, um, not all cases may be goitrous. This duox 2, uh, these are basically responsible for H2O2 production. H2O2 is responsible for um, this iodide to iodine uh, oxidation. So when the, there is mutations, uh, they, there can be a wide variability in their presentations. They can present um, as goiter or without goiter. They can present as permanent or transient congenital hypothyroidism. And now these are being recognized as, uh, as a very important cause of uh, congenital hypothyroidism. Then our other causes are iodine deficiency. So uh, as we know, our country still has pockets of iodine insufficiency, typically in the, in the sub-Himalayan belt. So, for example, even recent studies from Kangra, uh, Himachal Pradesh, they have shown that up to 4% of uh, um, cord blood can have TSH more than 20. So, that's a very uh, high uh, level. So, iodine deficiency can cause, again, transient or permanent uh, hypothyroidism. Hypothalamic pituitary hypothyroidism, this is rare, with an estimated incidence of 1 in 50,000, can be isolated or accompanied by deficiency of other pituitary hormones. Remember that if you're, uh, if a newborn baby has microphallus, hypoglycemia, prolonged jaundice, always think about hypopituitism and uh, screen for it. 
Another important thing to remember is that sometimes, like I have seen in my own OPD, uh, children presenting at the age of one year, two year, with thyroid function reports and uh, with TSH, which is normal, T4, which is clearly low, and people have missed that because we are just tuned to looking at uh, TSH levels. So very important that all postgraduates should take this, that please look at T4 values also. So uh, in central hypothyroidism, typically TSH is not low. TSH is uh, like in the normal range. So don't think that TSH would be very low. TSH would be typically in the normal range, two to three micro unit per uh, ml. And uh, T4 or uh, total T4 or free T4 would be low. So genes associated with congenital hypothyroidism, so depending on, um, you know, right from hypothalamus, pituitary to thyroid, uh, various genes which are involved in hypothalamic pituitary development or TRS, or TSH signaling, thyroid development like uh, NKX2, FOXC1, these are responsible for some of the cases of thyroid dysgenesis and thyroid hormone biosynthesis. So thyroglobulin, TPO, DUOX2, all these genes can be, uh, are implicated in congenital hypothyroidism but a majority still remains sporadic. Thyroid uh, dysgenesis, majority is still sporadic with no known uh, genetic causes yet. So coming to transient hypothyroidism. So remember the transient hypothyroidism constitutes up to 25% of all cases. In fact, uh, um, you know, many papers don't actually report uh, the long-term follow-up of their patients with the uh, who were diagnosed in newborn screening. But if follow-up is done, those papers that report follow-up till two to three years of age, of children with congenital hypothyroidism identified on newborn screening, they suggest that up to 25% have transient form. And uh, what are the etiologies? It can be primary or again central. So central can also be transient, primary can also be transient. It can be either iodine deficiency or excess. Excess will cause something called wolf chaikoff effect. So uh, when there is excessive iodine, basically uh, the thyroid is adapted in such a way that it will protect the organism from thyrotoxicosis. So there is down-regulation of the sodium iodide symporter as well as the TPO. So that is, uh, there is sort of shutdown of the thyroid uh, hormone synthesis. So excessive iodine, for example, if a preterm infant is, uh, you know, ex a lot of betadine is applied, even that can cause uh, uh, transient hypothyroidism. Then maternal uh, TSH receptor blocking antibodies as in mothers with history of autoimmune uh, thyroid disorder, maternal antithyroid medications, both propylthiouracil as well as carbimazole, they can both cause uh, hypothyroidism in a mother with Graves' disease. Then deox mutation, as I told you, it can cause permanent or transient hypothyroidism. And sometimes we see uh, which is what is known as isolated hypothyroidopenemia. That is, TSH is high, but T4 is normal. Then again, central can be uh, transient in case of maternal hyperthyroidism. So the fetal HPT axis is uh, suppressed. In transient hypothyroxinemia of prematurity, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Drugs, dopamine. How does dopamine cause uh, transient hypothyroxinemia? Dopamine causes uh, dopamine as well as steroids. They both lead to inhibition of TSH secretion by the anterior pituitary. So these are both inhibitors of TSH. Then sick youth thyroid syndrome, again in sick babies, sick preterm babies, it's not that, uh, you know, it's just that the HPT excess is immature. In sick preterm babies, there are multiple causes. So what do we see in such babies that there'll be low TSH along with low T3 and even low T4. So you can suspect that this is looking like central uh, hypothyroidism, but uh, this is transient and this is related to uh, immaturity of the hypothyroidism, uh, the, the HPT axis, as, as well as various medications. Okay. So in transient hypothyroxinemia of prematurity, again, this is something very important. So like I um, asked Pooja also. So in her uh, baby, again, uh, it might have been missed because if you do TSH, then TSH would be initially low to normal, um, but T4 would be low. So it can be missed, but many times when you see transient hypothyroxinemia, then what is it and does it need tr treatment? So it can be seen in up to 85% of preterm babies for up to six to eight weeks. And it is primarily due to underdevelopment of the HPT axis, but also due to low iodine reserves and acute illnesses. Does it require treatment? So many uh, studies have shown that on follow-up, whether the baby had transient hypothyroxinemia or not, it did not affect their IQ scores later. And whether the baby was given levothyroxine supplementation or not, it did not affect their 
outcomes in terms of physical growth or cognition. So there is usual uh, uh, sort of consensus that it should not be treated. And this table shows the normal ranges. And again, uh, the main purpose of putting here is that you can see that uh, TSH is more or less, it is not affected too much. But when we look at free T4 levels, so there is a very clear cut rise in the free T4 levels as the gestation increases from 26 to 28 weeks, the median is just about 0.9. And at 35 plus, it is 1.4. So there's a very clear uh, increase in T4 with gestation. At lower gestations, the free T4s are low. So coming to the most important aspect that is newborn screening. So as amply, uh, you know, uh, advised by Dr. Raghupati also, newborn screening uh, should be, universal newborn screening should be done for hypothyroidism because it is, uh, it is really amenable to diagnosis. Early diagnosis makes a very big difference in terms of uh, the child's quality of life later, mental development. So uh, it can be done either on cord blood or using a dried blood spot on day two, three to five. And a screening for preterm or sick newborns should be performed similarly. That is either cord blood or day three, three to five. It should be done. It's not that it should not be done. It should be repeated later, but it should be done right, at, uh, right as you would do in other, other infants. So various approaches. Most common is the primary TSH. That is you only do TSH first. And backup T4, that is T4 is done only if TSH is elevated, more than 20. Um, it is definitely most sensitive, but it can miss central hypothyroidism and hypothyroxinemia with delayed elevation of TSH as happens in preterm babies. Then the other approach is primary T4 backup TSH, but uh, obviously this can miss milder cases. And concomitant uh, would be ideal, but expensive. So uh, cord blood versus DBS. So either of these methods can be uh, chosen. If you use cord sample, the benefit is that there is no extra prick to the infant. So if the baby is to be discharged early, as in many hospitals, then this is uh, easy to do. Sample can be processed any, at any local lab. Training is not required. Uh, but the disadvantage is that the other disorders cannot be screened. Then postnatal heel prick by using filter paper. The advantage is that it can be used to screen multiple disorders, can be done for home deliveries also if a proper, you know, uh, this thing is in place, a program is in place. But it needs special essay, so typically Delphia is done and a reliable central lab. Adequate training is required to ensure error-free uh, blood spots. And of course, there is some pain to the baby. So, but any of these methods can be chosen. So remember that the blood uh, you know, sample on the filter paper should be taken properly because only this will be eluted. So if you know spots are uh, not covering the entire circle, then your uh, value will be erroneous. Another important thing to remember is whole blood versus serum units. So if you're using a DBS, then of course, what you are taking is a whole blood sample. So in whole blood sample, the level would be on the lower side. This level needs to be multiplied by 2.2 to be equivalent to the level in serum because whatever interpretation we do is based on the level in serum. So if you're doing by DBS, the lab itself should report in serum units. It's not that the lab reports in whole blood and then you convert. But you, if you're, uh, you know, you should first check if, uh, if you have started doing it, please check with your lab that they are reporting in serum units. Otherwise, you need to multiply by 2.2. For example, a TSH of 10 milliunit per liter in DBS would be equivalent to TSH of 22 milliunit per liter in serum. So they would, uh, this should be ensured. Then if you do a screening TSH, then how to interpret it? So uh, below 20 milliunit per liter is normal. In case the DBS was done uh, before 48 hours, so 24 to 48 hours, as we sometimes need to do in, in hospitals where discharge is to be done early, then the level has to be taken as higher. Less than 34 is considered as, uh, as normal. And then no further testing is required. If the TSH level is between 20 to 40, remember we are talking about serum units, 20 to 40 million per liter or 34 to 40 in the early uh, sample, then it is considered as a borderline screen value. And the TSH as well as T4 or free T4 are to be repeated at seven to 10 days of life. If the level is more than 40, between 40 to 80, then again, you have to obtain a venous sample but you have to obtain at 72 hours. You don't have to wait till seven to 10 because this is obviously high. So you will uh, do a venous sample and initiate treatment if the repeat venous uh, levels are abnormal. So you will wait for starting the treatment. If it is more than 80, then you don't wait for starting the treatment. You start treatment immediately 
but you do obtain venous sample before starting and send it uh, to the lab. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so based on the confirmatory venous sample at 72 hours of life, <coughs> excuse me, if you have a high, high TSH, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Madam, you have three minutes. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, my throat is uh, bad. So I'll just quickly wind up. So based on the venous sample, again, basically, if you have low T4 and high TSH, then you have to start treatment. If your TSH and T4 are normal, then obviously no further treatment. If the TSH is high, but T4 is normal, <coughs> that is TSH is more than 20 or more than 10 in more than two weeks old baby, then you have to repeat after two weeks and start uh, treatment if the TSH persists to be more than 10 beyond three weeks of life. <coughs> so coming to imaging, uh, uh, you know, you should ideally do both ultrasound and nuclear scans. Nuclear scans are especially useful in diagnosing true a athyrosis or ectopy. But if they can't be done immediately, then treatment should be initiated and they can be done within seven days of starting treatment or at three years after stopping treatment for one month. So some examples of thyroid scan, this is normal. Then uh, this is no uptake, so agenesis. Here you can see that this is ectopic. This is almost at the, at the base of tongue. And this is uh, goiter with increased uptake. So uh, presence of gland on the ultrasound, but no uptake on technetium scan, what does it suggest? Most likely maternal TSH receptor blocking antibodies because the technate per technate also has to go um, through the sodium iodide symporter. And as I told you, TSH is important for the expression of sodium iodide symporter. So remember that if you don't have universal NBS, but there is family history of congenital hypothyroidism, history of thyroid disease or antithyroid medicine in the, in the mother, Presence of conditions like Down syndrome, trisomy 18, congenital heart disease, or some other conditions like Perry Robin, where there is known high incidence of CH, then you should screen. And of course, in any infant with signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, even in those with normal NBS, you should screen. So when should TSS screen be repeated if the initial screen was normal in birth situations? So in preterm infants who are born before 32 weeks, those with very low birth weight, acutely ill infants, those who have received blood or exchange transfusion, and in monozygotic twins, because in these, uh, because of the blood, they, there may be dilution of TSH and you may have a normal value. And in those with Down syndrome. So in all these situations, you should repeat the TSH at two to four weeks of life, even if the initial screen was normal. So treatment already discussed, start with 10 to 15 microgram per kg per day. You have to keep T4 or free T4 in the upper half of normal range. In the initial six months, you have to uh, first check for T4 and TSH one to two weeks after starting thyroxine. And then every two weeks till DSH is normalized. And then every two months till six months of age. Between six months to three years, every six months, beyond three years, every three to six months. Blood sample should be collected at least four hours after the last dose. And regular growth monitoring and developmental monitoring has to be done. There is query a uh, rising prevalence of CH if you see the recent data. But in most of these cases, actually, we see that the incidence of dysgenesis has not increased. But uh, there is increase in those with utopic, that is normal thyroid gland on USG. And in um, follow-up studies of these patients with normal thyroid gland, roughly 35% have transient, 40% have permanent, and 25% have just persistent isolated TSH rise. So and another important finding that has emerged from uh, these various studies that have, uh, I have listed here is that uh, sometimes even TSH and free T4 at diagnosis cannot truly differentiate between transient and permanent. That is, some babies, even with transient, can have high, a very high TSH and T4 and low T4. So more helpful predictor is persistence of a daily thyroxine requirement above 2 microgram per kg. And that is why a trial of treatment should be done in these situations. First, where treatment was initiated in the newborn period without complete evaluation or in preterm sick newborns. And second, where ultrasound is suggestive of normal thyroid gland or mild dyshormonogenesis, particularly those with a low, T uh, low thyroxine requirement. Obviously, in those in whom agenesis has been uh, proven or uh, the TSH is very, very high and uh, on thyroid ultrasound also, you're not able to see the gland and the requirement is continuing to be high. There is no point of 
giving a trial of treatment. Best outcome is when thyroxine started is started by two weeks at more than equal to 9.5 microgram per kg per day. But if treatment is started before three months, then more than 80% of infants have normal IQ, although they may have persistent minor uh, learning defects. So key messages are that it is the commonest preventable cause of intellectual imp impairment, ideal condition for universal newborn screening. You all should have a high index of suspicion whenever you see any infant with various features such as developmental delay, ghost species, constipation, uh, dry skin, etc. Look at FT4 or T4 values also besides TSH. Please don't miss central hypothyroidism. Sick preterm infants may be missed on initial screening. Repeat testing at two to four weeks is important. Transient CH is also common and trial of treatment is warranted in all infants in whom we are suspecting that the CH may be transient. And emphasize the importance of regular medication and follow-up to all families. In many cases, you see that despite you know, very high TSH values, they still don't follow your treatment and continue to have poor control. And this is uh, uh, very frustrating sometimes. So emphasize this importance. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much, madam. Uh, we have some questions. I request you to answer in the, the chat box. So because of lack of time, we are moving to the next uh, presentation. In spite of madam having the sore throat, you have given very extensive and uh, elaboratively. Thank you very much, madam. So once again, we thank uh, for coming and we request you to suggest further in pediatric endocrine for post graduates. We'll move to the next case. Any comments or anything from the uh, guide or co-guide? Yes, sir. My sir, last. I think it is very well covered and the question which we are asked for by, from Dr. Pooja is already answered by Dr. Vanna in her talk. So I think that is uh, good enough. So I don't think there is any extra comment needs to be done. Yeah, we thank team uh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, especially led by uh, my sir and Ankita Maheshwari. Now, uh, we go to the next case by Dr. Disha Pandya from SAIMS Indore. And uh, her guide is Dr. Ankita Maheshwari, Associate Professor from uh, SAIMS. And uh, examiner will be Dr. Ravindra Kumar, sir. He is uh, Vice President, IAP, North Delhi, and also Professor from the North Delhi Municipal Medical College. Over to Disha. Hello. Yeah, please share the screen, please. You are audible. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Visible. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Disha Pandya, third year PhD resident uh, pediatrics at Sam Sundar. Uh, we will be dealing with the case of acquired hypothyroidism over here. So, uh, starting from the history, a 14-year-old first-born girl, resident of Dhar district, presented in PICU with complaints of difficulty in breathing, fever, cough, not gaining height, and lethargy. So, uh, my in detail, uh, my patient was apparently all right six months back. Then she complained of difficulty in breathing, which was gradual in onset, progressive in nature. Uh, in the form that initially the dyspnea was on exertion, which further progressed to dyspnea even on routine activities. And since last two days, she had dyspnea even at rest. So there was progression from N by H A grade 2 to grade 4 uh, that aggravated during supine position and partially relieved in sitting position. She had fever since last two days, which was insidious onset, low grade, undocumented, not associated with any uh, chills or rigors or no diarrhea variation. Cuff was there since last 8 to 10 days, which was insidious onset, non-productive, dry in nature, with no diurnal or postural variation, relieved, of, relieved on medications, with no complaints of any chest pain or hemoptysis. Uh, the patient also complained that she had lethargy since last two years uh, in the form of excessive sleepiness and, and inertia in her routine activities. 
and according to her mother the child was not gaining height since last 4 to 5 years as compared to her peers and not outgrowing her clothes and shoes there was no history of any congenital heart disease in family or blue circulation skin or any squatting episodes no history of any loss of appetite or weight loss any history of cox contact blood transfusion vomiting loose stools or abdominal pain or pain in joints photosensitivity malar rash or any similar history in past child was a full term vaginal delivered with a birth weight of 2.7 kg she the her development was normal for her age she was studying in ninth class and was average in studies uh um, family history mother had history of hypothyroidism since last 7 to 8 years she was in treatment of uh, she was on thyroxine tablet with a dose of 100 micrograms <clears throat> so basically it, this is a 14 year old girl with born of non consensual marriage who presented to us with history of dyspnea lethargy acute cough with non contributory birth or past history and with positive family history of hypothyroidism so right now uh, we were suspecting a, a cardiac system to be involved primary or secondary cause that had to be evaluated further rather than a respiratory cause anthropometric oh, just a minute just a minute go back uh, we request post graduates to uh, just think over the diagnosis at the end of summary so when we are presenting in the final examination either mpd or dnb at the end of summary we should be able to tell the diagnosis if you are not able then you have to go to the examination just will you 30 seconds all of you type your diagnosis please okay. yes disha you can go ahead yes sir anthropometrically we saw that the child had a, a normal 35 kg weight with a height of minus 5.6 standard deviation a normal bmi so she was a short stature with normal weight and bmi with delayed bone age of 9.7 years so, on uh, examination vital child was conscious uh, she had bradycardia that is 80 beats per minute Rel relative bradycardia was there uh, uh, with tachypnea of 40 uh, breaths per minute bp was uh, 98 by 74 a little lower side fifth centile for age and gender pulses were well felt normal volumic with no radio radial or radio femoral delay she was maintaining saturation on room air gvp was raised that is 7 cm of external angle with positive pulses paradoxes and hepatojugular reflex was present on general examination child had had a dull and apathetic look she had dry skin broad nasal bridge pallor was there moderate uh, uh, moderate grade nakal uh, pigmentation was present smr was pre pubertal uh, she had bilateral non pitting pedal edema and there was no icterus cyanosis lymphadenopathy or any other facial dysmorphism on system examination cardiovascular system uh, the apex was seen at on inspection apex was seen at 6 intercostal space lateral to the middle uh, mid clavicular line with no precordial bulge visible marks of dilated veins and this uh, inspect inspect inspectory findings was confirmed on palpation also there was no palpable p2 or parasternal heave or thrill on auscultation child had normal heart sounds at all the areas but but the heart sounds were muffled muffled heart sounds were present with no murmur or pericardial rub <clears throat> on respiratory examination uh, bilateral air entry was decreased which was uh, it was decreased more on left rather than the right side vascular breathing was present and no other uh, added sound abdominal examination was normal and on cns examination uh, cranial limb examination was normal uh, tone uh, tone was normal on the, all the limbs she had uh, the deep tendon reflexes was normal but had delayed relaxation the dtrs had delayed relaxation so to summarize this is a 14 year old girl with pathological short stature and on the basis of history and examination uh, uh, we uh, thought it to be a possibly a case of pericardial effusion uh, with lethargy and delayed puberty we made the uh, most likely diagnosis which we uh, first most likely diagnosis which we made was hypothyroidism 
Second was Turner syndrome. As a child who was short stature and presenting with delayed puberty, we should always think of uh, a Turner syndrome. The other uh, two diagnoses were uh, uh, on the uh, downline uh, diagnosis. These were least likely, but yes, tuberculosis in SLE. SLE as a child was adolescent girl, a uh, girl child and uh, the age group. On investigating further, we found that the child had macrocytic anemia. Uh, HB was 8.2, MCB was 102. Uh, renal functions were normal. TSH was very high, more than 100 international unit per liters. 3T4 was low, 0.5 nanogram per deciliter. Electrolytes were normal. Anti-TPO antibodies were positive, that is 110 international unit per liter. Uh, bone age, as I've mentioned, it was a delayed, 9.3 years. Uh, chest X-ray, I will show it in, uh, in further photographs. There was a massive cardiomegaly was present in chest X-ray. This we can see the chest X-ray, there was massive cardiomegaly. And in the 2D echo, we can see the pericardial effusion beside the uh, uh, cardiac wall. 2D echo was uh, suggestive of a massive pericardial effusion with evidence of tamponade, though LVF was preserved, that is 60%. And USG pelvis had normal, normal volumic ovaries and a prepubertal uterus. This is the child, though we have we didn't have the photograph uh, of the child pre uh, uh, of her pre-illness. We didn't have a pre-illness photograph of the child. So this is after the recovery. Uh, this is the chest x-ray showing cardiomegaly and 2D goes showing massive pericardial effusion. So uh, initially stabilization was done and urgent pericardial tapping was done. That is 450 to 500 ml of fluid was drained and uh, was sent for sampling and uh, it uh, showed an exudative uh, uh, fluid and the nature of the fluid. There. It, was, it was an exudative nature of the fluid. And so we started the child on thyroxine with a rate of 1.1 microgram per kg per day of total of 37.5 micrograms per day. So final diagnosis we kept as hypothyroidism, uh, autoimmune thyroid disease with pericardial effusion. Uh, we follow up the follow followed up the patients after two months. Improvement in symptoms were reported. There was three centimeter height gain in two months. TSH value decreased to twelve point two and three T four came to upper normal range that is one point two nanogram per deciliter. And two D co was done, which was uh, suggestive of a normal LV function with mild pericardial effusion was there. After six months, we followed there was a height gain of five centimeters in six months. As she started developing uh, breast, that is, uh, uh, she started getting the pu pubertal changes. TSH was 4.5 and FT4 was 1.1. 2D co was normal at this time. There was no pericardial effusion and normal LV function was there. <clears throat> I would just like to enumerate some of the uh, causes of acquired hypothyroidism, that is, autoimmune. Uh, it can be drug induced, post ablative because of irradiation. Yeah, Disha, please uh, stop. There is a lecture. We'll have that in that. So now the case is open for discussion. I request all the examiners, uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Uh, may I ask you questions? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Varnath. And Dr. Disha, it's a very beautiful and interesting case. I mean, hypothyroidism presenting as a target component, it's not a usual uh, presentation, very yes, sir. Yes, and it has been managed and you know investigated beautifully and that, that's the full marks to you however i had a couple of questions for you and so what yes. was the reason of fever in your case so yes sir about having fever what was the reason of fever in your case uh, sir we were suspecting some acute cause due to any illness or any viral illness maybe any viral illness okay and mother was what type of hypothyroidism mother was having uh, it was autoimmune? Yes, sir. We suspected autoimmune uh, hypothyroidism only, but we asked for any uh, anti TPO investigations uh, if, if she had, but she, it was not available for from her side, sir. But we were suspecting anti autoimmune uh, hypothyroidism. Yes, the reports were not available. What sort of hypothyroidism mm -hmm. mother is having? Yes, sir. Uh, in anthropometry, uh, by plotting on growth chart, you said the SV minus 5 SV is high. So how you yes, calculate SD in this uh, fourteen-year-old girl? Um, 
because you know by chart it is uh, uh, IIT Goa chart you have used. They are saying less than third percentile. You said yes, uh, is somewhere I, I think minus five or some. You show on in yes, slides. So how you calculate yes, it as the in forty meter of third percentile? So standard deviations are uh, not on growth chart, but from the app we calculated the standard deviation. Because if you calculate it, it, uh, this is a question which examiner may ask, or usually we ask over DNDs, how they calculated the SD in 14 years. Even I want to know. Then in CBS, you said S1 and S2 is normal, and then sounds are muffled. So if our sounds are muffled, obviously it can't be normal. Sir, uh, they were no, they were no added murmurs. They were uh, heard. Yeah, that is okay, fine. Heard. See, if her sounds are muffled, muffled means it's very uh, low pitch sounds. Yes, sir, low pitch so sounds. But they were be normal because these are then it, it is all muffled. Yes, sir. Then in respiratory system, you didn't you said bilateral air entry decreased more on the left than right. So what about yes, percussion? Because it is giving me an impression of some plural effusion. You said sir, uh, the, yes, sir. Sir, we uh, we also suspected that the child might have plural effusion just on the basis of history. Uh, but uh, on it's percussion, more appreciable if you have written the percussion finding also. Yes, sir. Then sir, you, DD, you make first TD of hypothyroidism. Why? It's very uncommon. I won't make. I mean, sorry. I mean, hypothyroidism is a you know very rare. Rather than we have. A couple of more common things which can cause all these malnutrition. They may have, you know, cardiac findings. So why hypothyroidism as a first? Sir, first of all, the look of the child. Uh, the look was, was very apathetic, and a dry skin was there. Secondly, uh, the child was a short stature. So then there was a, a delayed puberty was there. Mother had a positive. We had a positive family history of hypothyroidism, and uh, also the child had a history of excessive sleepiness since last two years. And there was a decrease in uh, movement, a decreased, uh, she was uh, a little slow in all her activities in last two years. And uh, so, uh, the, uh, she had uh, this history of lethargy. That's why, so all these things. And all these features can be explained by tuberculosis very well, and which is more common and causing all these cardiac complications rather than hypothyroidism. Uh, yes, sir, tuberculosis, uh, 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 yes, sir. But why at first instance hypothyroidism? So, to, uh, so just by, by the look of the child and the history of lethargy and uh, it is mother, mother had a positive history of 14 years of age by look. But anyway, I mean, hypothyroidism is uh, I mean, good. But first diagnosis, hypothyroidism, I mean, something will be, uh, I mean, you can put it second or third. Uh, tuberculosis, which is very common, very rampant in our Country and it can cause anything. You know, yes. Prover goes for tuberculosis, it can cause every, anything except pregnancy. So, so all these malnutrition, short stature, delayed puberty may be there. It is such a short stature. Uh, then USC palvish, I mean, uh, it's good. You have done, you said pre-pubertal uterus. Anything more uh, we can ask for to look for uh, to just uh, say that it is pre-pubertal, apart from just they have writing, means shades of uh, shape of the uterus, size of the uterus, volume of the of the, all these things. Can it be uh, done? So, uh, beg your pardon, sir. I didn't get the question, sir. Uh, your voice was uh, interrupted in between. Okay, okay. Ultrasound pallus has been done just to know the pubertal status. So when yes, we are sir. writing uh, ultrasound just to know the pubertal status, so it is more uh, appreciable and knowledgeable if we know the shape of the uterus, it is tubular or pear shaped, size of the uterus, what is the size, what is the uh, volume of the uterus, what is the volume of the ovary, is there any follicles, how much is the number of follicles. Uh, and have you done, I mean, just uh, have you done any hormone investigation, LH and FSH in this case? Yes, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Like no, sir. Upside, it is by, the, by SMR reading, sir. We did okay. SMR and reading. You a couple of queries, although you, you managed this case very in a very good way. Obviously, it was, uh, I mean, 
because uh, hypothyroidism causing it and just give uh, thyroxine and patient will be all right. That is true. Thank you. Over to Dr. Amarnath. Yeah, thank you very much. Now I request any other examiners, including uh, Dr. Mujay, sir. And, uh, Disha, Disha, good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, I think you presented very well. I am having few. The first thing that I congratulate uh, you and Dr. Ankita that you kept the hypothyroidism as one of the differential diagnoses in this child because we, just like Dr. Ravindra is saying, there are many differential diagnoses that usually comes first when you are thinking about hypothyroidism. Uh, so I just wanted to know a few things uh, from your presentation. What type of uh, pericardial effusion you normally get in hypothyroidism? Sir, we normally get an exudative type of pericardial effusion. Okay. From my knowledge, I think it is primarily the transudate. Exudative, it's a hypoth exudative collection is not that common. That can happen. But most of the time, it is a transudate collection that was there. Maybe. Uh, and the second thing is, I just wanted to know uh, that when you perform this thyroid uh, interpretation, thyroid hormone interpretation, at that time, can you just explain about the sick thyroid syndrome? At what time you did? And can it just affecting your... Uh, lay values and your interpretation. So what is sick thyroid syndrome? Can that may be the reason in the acute sick child, in the acute illness, you perform these investigation and it turned out to be a uh, picture of primary hypothyroidism. So that is the one other point that can be considered uh, because you manage and the child has shown the response. There are other parameters also that can suggest that most of the child is having hypothyroidism. So you manage them very well in that way. But I think as a postgraduate, probably you just need to think, is there this hormonal, this hormone assay interpretation is really correct at that particular time. Now, the third question is, what about the CPO antibody? You said it's 110. When we should say significant yes, CPO, uh, the title should be how much times, then only you can consider it as a significant. Okay, so I think mm -hmm. the next lecturer probably mm -hmm. is going to answer these questions. So there are a few things that need to be taken care of whenever you think about uh, this particular uh, differential diagnosis. Well done, Disha. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I request Raghupati, sir, anyone has any questions, please ask. I have one question, uh, Disha, for you. Very well yes, presented. Sir. Suppose yes, if I start full dose of thyroxine, can I start in this child? It's a chronic um, case. No, no, sir. No, sir. sir we if should I start, start what will happen? Why you should not start? Yes. Sir, because uh, the high dose of thyroid may will cause increase in BMR of the child. And that may uh, further further worsen uh, uh, that may cause failure, uh, uh, cause CCF or further worsen the CCF which the child already had. That's why we should always, uh, uh, in chronic hypothyroidism, we should always start with a low dose and our target should be to maintain uh, upper uh, the uh, T4, level, T4 level at the upper normal range. So, by community medicine, just I wanted to ask a question. What message you want to give to our fellow pediatricians and uh, the pediatric postgraduates? In 14 years, why child was missed? <clears throat> Sir, yes. um, um, sir, uh, anthropometry. Anthropometry is the. Uh, should no, be my question is community pediatrics. Why child was missed till this age, and how you would have been prevented? Yes, sir. That's what, sir. Uh, whenever a child is coming to your clinic, it uh, at, at in early in a early earlier uh, age groups, we should always uh, um, we should never forget to take the anthropometry of the child. Uh, and uh, other than this. Uh, do you want to use the growth charts? Yes, the growth charts. Yes. Sir. Do you want charts. to use the bone age? Yes, Any sir. Child? Yes. yes. So left yes. hand and right hand of pediatric endocrinologist as a pediatrician for short stitcher, growth chart and bone age should be done should in be all done. way. So take home message. Anyone has any other questions, sir? Oh, go one, the... Only one observation. I have many questions, but uh, yes, sir. don't want to Long, prolong this. I just want to ask uh, Disha. Uh, yes, sir. You said tuberculosis as a differential diagnosis. 
tuberculosis yes, is a very very vague condition you tuberculosis of what and never yes, tuberculosis you must specify tuberculosis of what hypothyroidism and uh, diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis as a differential diagnosis is not right you must say where sir most pro probably a disseminated tuberculosis that may cause uh, any uh, 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 any signs of peri uh, pleural effusion or pericardial effusion a disseminated do you, do, you, do you expect a disseminated tuberculosis patient to be well enough to come to the clinic for short stage will the um, child not be very malnourished uh, yes sir and uh, that's not a diagnosis I i'm uh, finding it very difficult to accept tuberculosis as a diagnosis okay carry on sir any other question sir you have one more question you can ask sorry uh, we have forgot you yeah now i request uh, ravindra kumar sir uh, to proceed for the acquired hypothyroidism uh, presentation and uh, this presentation will be provided to you on telegram so please concentrate most important area don't take any notes or uh, the pictures we'll send you the ppt in your telegram group over to you sir sir is a great teacher passionate and we request you to from the ec on behalf of ec uh, here we three people are there dr ravindra kumar sir mahesh sir and me and aila madam we want you to see the congenital hypothyroidism video please don't forget and spread it to the all the people over to you sir uh, thank you dr amarnath i think uh, uh, previous uh, presentation has to be closed so that i can share my screen please sir disha please uh i think i have to go to the share screen share screen then i have to go to my uh you op say. you open your presentation first sir okay and, okay and then you share screen Is it visible? No, sir. Not no. it. Okay, just a minute. Yeah. I hope now it is visible. Yeah. Yes. Sir. No. Yes. Sir. It is full slide visible. No, no, no sir. It's no. not in the screen. Now it is full no. slide visible. Yeah. Yes. Now you can go ahead, sir. Good evening, everyone, and I think it's very nice discussion and two very good case presentation has been done today, and even I learned a couple of new things in this presentation and very good lecture by Dr. Vandana, ma'am. And after that lecture, uh, my job is little easy. So, and before uh, I proceed for anything, I I always pray to God to give us knowledge and wisdom. to treat all these needy patients so as we know i mean what is acquired hypothyroidism that reduced production of thyroid hormone is a central feature of this clinical state which is known as hypothyroidism however apart from reduced production it may be reduced action of thyroid hormone at the tissue level that which is the normal uh, increased thyroid hormone production to our thyroid gland can also be associated with clinical hypothyroidism uh, hypothyroidism it, it is the most common disturbance of the thyroid function in children acquired hypothyroidism can be caused by both either thyroid disease known as primary hypothyroidism and hypothalamic pituitary disease which is known as central hypothyroidism as we see in congenital hypothyroidism primary hypothyroidism which may again may be either subclinical where the tsh level is increased but free t4 level is normal or it may be overt which is very clear cut diagnosis tsh is increased and serum free t4 is low as we have just seen in this case 
Apart from this, there are two very common terms they are used, autoimmune thyroiditis and autoimmune thyroid disease. However, these two are two different things. Autoimmune thyroiditis, it is the most common cause of acquired hypothyroidism, also synonymous with chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis or Hashimoto thyroiditis. If you look at the autoimmune thyroid disease, this is somewhat is a broader term, which is encompassing disorders with autoimmune mechanism that have a risk for both hypothyroidism and hypothyroidism. Both may be the possibility. I mean, then there are certain features, clinical features, where we raise possibility of acquired hypothyroidism. As you know, congenital hypothyroidism, we do the universal screening. However, in acquired uh, hypothyroidism, we usually have some clinical features where we thought of hypothyroidism and advise appropriate investigation. And common of these are short stature. Sometimes it may be just isolated presentation of hypothyroidism. Poor growth velocity, goiter may be visible, cause which raise the possibility of hypothyroidism, then dry skin, constipation, all of us are aware, sluggishness, as was in our last case, precocious puberty, which is not true, which is a pseudo precocious puberty, and apart from Precocious puberty may be delayed puberty also. Macroarchidism in males, the weight gain may be there, which is not because of the obesity rather than the edema. Calf muscle hypertrophy, galactorrhea, galactorrhea because of the increased production of relactin, and cardiomyopathy or card pericardial effusion or pleural effusion I have just seen in the last case. If you look at the findings on examination in primary hypothyroidism, the most common physical finding is presentation is usually a diffusely enlarged thyroid gland called goiter. However, alternatively, the thyroid gland may be normal in size or may not be palpable at all. Other abnormalities that may include short stature, apparent overweight, which is already said it is more because of the fluid retention rather than the obesity. Puffy faces with a dull, placid expression, bradycardia, pseudo hypertrophy of the muscles, delayed deep tendon reflexes, which is very, very important, as we have just seen in our last case. Abnormal findings in chest and cardiac auscultation may point to pleural or pericardial effusion. And these effusions, they resolve very well in levothyrox in treatment, as we have just witnessed. So we must not forget to put our stethoscope on chest and cardiac reason, just to look for any abnormality there. If you look at the etiology of uh, acquired hypothyroidism, it may be uh, uh, autoimmune hypothyroiditis, which is the most common, that may be iodine deficiency, as just Dr. Vandana has said, still it is prevalent despite being the salt being fortified with the iodine, as we see in Kangara Valley of hypo. Uh, Himachal Pradesh, where still 4% of people found to be having low uh, iodine status. There may be some drugs which is blocking either synthesis or release of uh, thyroid hormones. And a few of them are antipleptic drugs like phenytoin, phenobarb, velpriate, then lithium used in psychiatric disorders, anti-cancerous drugs like interferon alpha, thyroxine, Chinese innovators, <clears throat> interleukin 2, and to be very important, not to miss amiodarol. Could be because of the thyroid infiltration by cystinosis, LCH, or maybe because of the amyloidosis. post ablative thyroiditis, when hyperthyroidism has not, patient not gone into the remission, has been treated with radioactive ablation and landed in hypothyroidism later on post thyroidectomy because of the surgery. And there may be some gut regions in foodstuffs or endemic pollutants. However, how much it is relevant in Indian scenario, I mean, not known. Literature lists them. Then maybe secondary or tertiary because of the pituitary origin, which is the secondary, if there are hypothalamic disorder, then tertiary. Baxalton, it is again a retinoid X receptor agonist used in T-cells lymphoma, causes the hypothyroidism, then as Dr. Vandana has already said about the dopamine, dobutamine, steroids, and severe illness, they all can, can cause hypothyroidism, but obviously transient in nature. Maybe because of the conjunctive hypothyroidism, 
because there is a rapid destruction of thyroid hormone because of the D3 expression in these large hemangioma and more especially in liver. Then there are many disorders which are associated with the autoimmune thyroid disease. So we have to be very careful when dealing with these uh, diseases. For example, Down syndrome, Turner, Klinefelter, or Noonan, they may present uh, with thyroid disorders. Again, APS2 and 1, type 1 diabetes, as there's always a dictum, the type K pace of type 1 diabetes should be investigated for other autoimmune diseases like thyroid disorders, then celiac disease, unile idiopathic arthritis, Addison's disease, cases of vitiligo, alopecia, areta, pernicious anemia, and immune glomerulonephritis. They may have concomitant simultaneously thyroid problem and IPEX syndrome. Now, how to, after making the diagnosis, we have seen the clinical feature of a patient. We have examined the patient. We are thinking that probably patient may have thyroid disorder, may be suffering from hypothyroidism. So to assess the thyroid function, uh, we one can go for total T4 and T3 levels along with the indices that reflects the thyroid hormone binding proteins, especially T3 or T4 resin uptake. The level of free T4 are measured to assess thyroid hormone status without the confounding influences, especially all the carrier proteins. However, critical in the critical in the interpretation of all these hormone value is the recognition that these concentration of T4, T3, and TSS they vary with the age. So one has to be very careful while interpreting the results because most of the time what lab is giving is the giving the adult reference range. But as uh, Dr. Vandana has given a chart where, you know, by the year, day and months, these uh, levels changes. If after doing all these investigations, for example, T3, T4, and TSH, which is the baseline essential investigation whenever someone is suspecting thyroid problems. So there may be a couple of scenarios. For example, TSH may be elevated and pre-T4 is low. So that's a clear cut diagnosis when TSH elevation is more than 10 and low free to 4, then it's a case of overt primary hypothyroidism. However, in addition, sometimes children with central hypothyroidism, they have a mild TSH elevation, although most of the time it is either within the range or low, but sometimes they may have a mild TSH elevation. That has to be taken care of in mind when you are interpreting the results of T elevated TSH with low pre T4. Another scenario may be when the TSH is elevated but normal free T4, this persistent elevation of TSH with normal free T4 that is again compatible with subclinical hypothyroidism. For patient with serum TSH is more than 10, treatment is required. However, all, for all those children which is having mild TSH elevation, somewhere between 5 to 10 milliunit. So the further elevation and monitor to determine either it is a, <clears throat> this TSH elevation persist or whether it is likely to develop clinically uh, overt hypothyroidism or not. So this mild T uh, elevation of TSH that is somewhere 5 to 10, it occurs to a couple of uh, scenarios, for example, in obesity, patient 10 to 23% of patients in a couple of studies, they were having the TSH elevation. However, the free T3 and free uh, T4 values, they were normal. So it was not case of overt hypothyroidism, rather subclinical hypothyroidism. Maybe one scenario where serum TSH is low or normal with low free T4. So these findings are consistent with the central hypothyroidism. However, as there was discussion, just uh, Dr. Maheshwar discussing, may be found with non-thyroid illness syndrome also. So if thyroid function tests are obtained in a patient with acute or chronic illness, in acute illness, as has been taken in our case in PICU, they should be repeated after recovery from the illness before making a definitive diagnosis. A few children with central hypothyroidism, as already has said, they have slightly high they may have slightly high serum TSH because they are secreting the immunoreactive TSH, but this is not biological active, it is biological inactive. Hence, 
central hypothyroidism. However, while interpreting all these uh, hormone levels, one has to be very careful about a couple of scenarios where thyroid hormones, the levels are maybe abnormal, yet the individual is euthyroid. And to enumerate, two are very, very important. When free T4 values are normal, yet total T4 values are high, then uh, should be thought of familial dysalbuminic hyperthyroxinemia. It should be considered as a cause. Family history should be taken. Otherwise, erroneously, these patients will be treated as a case of hyperthyroidism. If free T4 values are normal, but total T4 values are low, then deficiency must be entertained so that erroneously C again should not be treated as a case of hypothyroidism while this is absolutely euthyroid patient. So we have to pay attention to total T4 values. It is high or low. If low, TBG deficiency is one possibility. If high, then familial dysalbuminic hyperthyroxinemia. Coming to the primary hypothyroidism, but the further evaluation, uh, evaluation has to be done. So patient with overt hypothyroidism, if they are having elevated TSH and low free T4, may be tested to look for the autoimmune thyroiditis by measuring anti-TPO antibodies and anti-thyroglobulin antibodies. Anti-TPO antibodies will be present in 85 to 90% cases of autoimmune thyroiditis. However, anti-thyroglobulin antibody may be positive with just 30 to 50% of the cases. However, if a child who is having hypothyroidism and positive thyroid antibodies and having a palpable goiter also, then ultrasound examination may be done to obtain the typical hypoechoic and hyperechoic uh, hypoechoic uh, pattern that is known as Mothsitan or Strischi's like pattern or the immune thyroiditis. If a patient sometimes has a marketedly asymmetric goiter or a palpable nodule, Ultrasound examination there comes very important to determine the size and eco characteristics of these goiter and nodules and determine if FNAC has to be done or is needed or not. Few words about subclinical hypothyroidism. In patient with subclinical hypothyroidism where TSH is elevated and normal pre T4. So those with positive anti TPO antibodies, they are at risk to develop overt hypothyroidism over time. However, not all developed. And this is a case when this TSH is somewhere between 5 to 10. If more than 10, the patient has requires treatment, has to be treated. As already said, in children with obesity, mild elevation of TSH are common and may not warrant antibody testing if free T4 is normal. If there is a patient who is having no evidence of autoimmune thyroiditis, for example, normal TPO and thyroglobulin antibody and but persistently elevated TSH may be caused by the mutation is the TSH receptor genes causing resistance to TSH. Although not very common, uncommon situation, however, has to be kept in mind. While evaluating the central hypothyroidism, the, the children who are confirmed it should undergo cranial imaging with contrast, preferably MRI because we want to know the status of the pituitary and test for other pituitary hormone deficiency, for example, cortisol, growth hormone, and other hormone, because patient may have hypopituitarism rather than having the isolated thyroid hormone deficiency. After making the diagnosis, going through the clinical features, then examination, then doing the biochemical investigation, when uh, we know that patient, we are dealing with a patient of hypothyroidism. The treatment of choice is tablet levothyroxin, which has to be given once a day. Timing is very, very important. Should be given 60 minutes prior to the food consumption. As many a times our older children, for example, four year, five year, six year, they may be taking iron, calcium, and soy products. So should not be given along with them. There should be a gap of at least three to four hours between these two medicines. Many preparation for thyroxine are available, for example, tablet, gel, or syrup. However, in India, as far as I know, it's only tablet is available, and this is good enough. Dose, although it changes as per the age, from one to three years, as someone asking 
in neonatal uh, congenital hypothyroidism for how long 15 microgram per kg body weight has to be given. So by the age of one year, those came down to somewhere four to six microgram per kg per day. But obviously, it has to be done along with the biochemical markers. Three to 10 years, go, those again goes down somewhere three to five microgram. 10 to 16 years, two to four microgram. And in adult, one to 1.75 microgram per kg per day. Sir, for your attention, you have three more minutes. Thank you. Okay, I'm just completing. Uh, to remember in a much better way, 100 microgram per meter square per day is better. Then we can know the body surface area and can accordingly calculate the dose. Follow-up, somewhat different from congenital hypothyroidism. Initially, after giving the after starting the medicine, six to eight weeks after, it has to be seen that yes, after dose, our TSH has gone down. Free T4 has come in the range. Then three monthly till linear height is achieved. Older children may be done at six monthly. TSH has to be maintained somewhere one to three micro IO per ml. Free T4 to be maintained within the reference range of the age. Goal of the treatment, patient has to be high euthyroidism, should have normal growth and developmental, including the pubertal development. So these three uh, parameters has to be seen on every visit rather than just seeing the biochemics, chemical uh, investigation. Some precautions has to be taken for long-standing full-blown untreated hypothyroidism as we're discussing, thyroxine should be started at a lower dose, somewhere one third to half of the dose and gradually stepped up over several weeks to reach full dosing as uh, has been done in the last case because if profound hypothyroidism will be present, pseudotumor cerebri may develop, especially when dealing with the children somewhere eight to 12 years of age and they are treated with the conventional dose. The complication even may appear up to one to 10 months after initiation of treatment if we are starting the conventional dose. Thus, treatment is initiated with one third to one half of the usual dose of the lerothraxin. And after four to four, six weeks, patient can be advanced to conventional dose by a one quarter dose increase every four to six weeks. So that full dosing may be achieved by somewhere 12 to 16 weeks. We'll look at the algorithm to for the acquired uh, uh, hypothyroidism, symptoms and signs suggestive of hypothyroidism, Thyroid function test has been done, found to be abnormal. If TSH is normal, free T4 is no, uh, low. Then if free T4 is normal, TBG deficiency, hypoproteinemia. If normal TSH, and low T4. And if free T4 is also low, then it is central hypothyroidism and accordingly has to be investigated. Another scenario where TSH is just slightly as elevated, somewhere 5 to 10. T total T4 is normal. TPO antibody is negative. Most commonly, it is because of obesity and drugs. We may monitor these cases. However, if T4 is normal, but TPO antibody is positive, then it is better to monitor six monthly because few of cases, they may end up into overt hypothyroidism. However, if TSS is more than 10, then treat and find the etiology. So clinical features, signs and symptoms, which are suggestive of uh, hypothyroidism, biochemistry has to be done, essentially TSH plus total T4 or pre-T4. T3 is more used for hyperthyroidism rather than the hypothyroidism. Anti uh, TPU antibody and antithyroglobulin antibody titus may be done. Imaging ultrasound for primary hypothyroidism, if necessary. And but for uh, central hypothyroidism, MRI brain has to be done. Thyroxine is a treatment of choice in appropriate dose, appropriate timing, which is very, very important. And if it is chronic or severe hypothyroidism, then in a reduced dose. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for a nice talk. We can uh, take a couple of questions. Yeah, we don't have a time, uh, Jaivinder. Uh, because already nine o'clock we should end. Uh, I request Ravinder sir to uh, answer in the yeah, chat yeah, box. Yeah. I have because answered. we have to complete another two tasks. Oh. Thank you very much, sir. It was excellent discussion for both uh, case one and case two. Uh, thank you very much.
now we'll move to the next presentation that is oski in pediatrics and uh, this will be done by associate professor of uh, pediatrics dr ankita maheshwari from sams indore over to you ankita thank you very much for your support uh, for giving the second case that is acquired hypothyroidism case which was a classical case with pericardial effusion over to you thank you sir uh, sir uh, just wanted to ask ravindra sir one question sir asked disha that uh, from where we have calculated the standard deviation so uh, yes. sir there is an app called anthrocal which is uh, which you can download for free in iphone as well as android and anthrocal it, uh, it is for us app or uh, which is developed by aims no sir uh, up to 5 years it gives who z scores and after 5 years it gives iap z scores till 18 years okay uh, thank you actually that is why i was asking because he has shown me this uh, iap growth chart that is why i was asking the probably <laughs> yes. he has app there are two app one is yes, anthrocal an and another is developed by aims people yeah yeah, yeah it, it's the uh, same app which is developed by aims people sir anthrocal yeah yeah <laughs> so that that is the app usually we put a photograph of that thank one, you one more app is there sir which is anthropometric calculator that's okay. a uh, uh, app which is uh, developed by outside uh, people and that app, app contain lot of uh, other uh, useful uh, calculations you can calculate mph you can calculate predicted adult height in that app by in bp table app, they calculate by bp table this adapted uh, you, have the, you have to just enter the bone age by gp atlas and Uh, chronological age of the child, and it will give automatically give you predicted adult height. Yeah, Ankita, please you start sharing. <coughs> Sir, uh, is my screen visible? I've started sharing. Yeah, but you start sharing. Sharing, sharing. Screen yeah. is visible. Sharing is not. Already, it's been sharing. No, it has to be open. You just click it again, Doctor Ankita. Still not visible, kya, sir. इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ आस्की यू शुड नो ईच आस्की स्टेशन नॉट इट Let's share again. So around five to eight minutes. So each ASCII carries around eight to ten marks. So Sub division of four to eight questions will be there. It can it be so visible now, sir. Match the following. Not it. Match the following. Fill in the blanks. CT scan. Technician scans. Ultrasound. Or hmm, some reflexes. these will be kept in the aski uh, pediatrics counseling session mm-hmm. or growth chart or some syndromes uh, still not visible sir because it is visible on my system oh ma'am uh, do one thing just yeah. stop share your screen okay. okay then open your ppt and then share the screen okay yeah i thank dr jayvind sir for uh, answering the madam's question uh, at the back hand he is doing lot of work thank you dr jayvind sir okay. for answering all the questions of the audience thank you thank you thank you dr i thank all the participants yeah now it is visible okay so we will be giving 30 seconds to answer all the questions please think over again this ppt will be shared in the telegram so you should be very much attentive and you must be must be very much aware and you should know that ascii when we are doing you cannot carry over the papers of previous answers to the next question so we have to put the answer uh, chit in the box so be ready over to you Okay. Uh, so very good evening. We'll start with our OSCE. We'll uh, have a total of seven uh, stations, as Dr. Amarnath already mentioned, 
and uh, you will be getting 30 seconds for each of the uh, station and uh, if it's a complicated question you'll get more time so we'll start with our first station uh, a nine year old girl presented with a history of excessive sleepiness constipation and short stretcher on examination there is dry skin she had a grade two diffuse non-nodular symmetrical bosselated goiter her height was less than third centile while weight was preserved that is uh, on 25th centile biochemical investigation was suggestive of a high tsh 952 international units per ml with a very low free t4 of 0.5 nanogram per dl so these are the questions so this is the growth chart with a uh, weight on 25th centile and height less than third centile from the growth chart calculate the height age and the weight age what other biochemical investigations or radiological investigations you will order what is the treatment of choice with dose in this condition and how would you monitor the child so your time starts now yeah ideally you should have a growth chart at your hand uh, otherwise it's uh, not possible other they, questions you can answer you should have a yeah, scale yeah. also to get the chronological age and uh, the weight age and height age they have to answer all four questions in 30 seconds. No, you will get more, but we don't have a time. We are giving for just thinking. They will have a five minutes time. We don't have a time here, sir. You can answer B, C, D. Try. So should we take the answers? Yeah, just, yeah, go ahead. So uh, here you can see for height age and weight age calculation, I think everybody of uh, you must be aware that you have to draw, uh, draw a parallel line to the x-axis from the plotted height till it reaches the 50th centile line. And then you have to draw a perpendicular line till it reaches the x-axis. So that would give you the height age. And in this case, the height age is five years. Similarly for weight, draw a parallel line, then draw a perpendicular line. So the weight age here is 7.9 years. So if you can see the height age is more affected than the weight age and it is expected in endo any endocrine cause of short stature. Other investigations you, we would like to order is anti-TPO antibodies and antithyroglobulin antibodies as it's a case of most likely a case of acquired hypothyroidism and we can definitely do a USG thyroid to look for any ectopic thyroid if it is there. Uh, treatment of choice would be levothyroxine at a dose of 1 to 2 microgram per kg per day. So here we would start with 25 microgram per uh, daily since she uh, has a weight of 24 kg. And as Dr. Ravindra clearly mentioned that first thing comes is the clinical monitoring. So you have to monitor height and weight at regular intervals, maybe three monthly. And for biochemical monitoring, uh, we have to repeat TSH and free T4 after six weeks of starting dose and then every three monthly. But whenever we are changing the dose, again, you need to repeat your TSH and free to before after three, six weeks of any dose change. So we move to our next question. This is a four-year-old boy pres who presented with significant speech delay in pediatric OPD. On uh, history evaluation, uh, his 14-year-old sister also has a hearing loss and a goiter. And uh, they both are born of a first-degree consanguineous marriage. Again, uh, the weight is on the 20, 10th centile, that is minus 1.2 standard deviation, but his height is less than, min, um, less than minus three standard deviation. So what is your likely diagnosis? What are the characteristic feature of this condition? How would you confirm your diagnosis? And how would you explain goiter and hearing loss in the same patient? What is the mode of inheritance of this condition? Your time starts now. So multiple systems are involved. Syndrome, should think. I think there are already there made are it clear actually. I think there are three postgraduates, so I think we can just immediately answer, ask them the answer if they are able to do it. Then okay, otherwise we can uh, continue. Yeah, the... thirty seconds over. Yeah. So can we ask the postgraduates, or we we'll move to the answers? Just run like that. They okay. will see. We don't have a time. Okay. Yeah. So the syndrome is Pendred syndrome has already, ta has already taken beautifully by Dr. Vandana Jain, madam. It is characterized by congenital sensory hearing loss and a goiter. 
and the uh, mutation is this in uh, iodide transporter potassium iodide transporter so we have a gene panel which are responsible for uh, the mutation in uh, this particular transporter and why there is hearing loss because the same transporter is there in the out inner ear which leads to hear loss hearing loss and uh, this channel leads to thyroid dishormonogenesis leading to reduced organification of iodine and that is why hypothyroidism and the mode of uh, inheritance is autosomal recessive this explains uh, both brother and sister having the same disease our uh, next station a 5 year old girl who was previously well presented in pisu with a history of weight loss loss of appetite and sleep difficulty on examination she was hyperthermic she had a toxic look she had tachycardia hypertension resting tremors her peripheries were warm she had a exophthalmos and a small goiter grade 1 which is which was non nodular and diffuse ecg leads were suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy and uh, she had a positive family history of paternal grandfather taking treatment of hypothyroidism so you have to name the condition what is the expected thyroid function test in this condition name the scale which is used for the diagnostic criteria of the condition name the specific antibodies which can be ordered after stabilization and three drugs which you will use in this patient to manage the condition so your time starts now so i think all of you have the answers in their mind so we'll go to the answers so it is thyroid storm with hyperthyroidism uh, it is a very close dd of hyper uh, hyperthyroidism and thyroid storm but since our patient had a toxic look tachycardia and ecg was suggestive of left ventricular dysfunction so uh, the diagnosis is thyroid storm we would expect a decreased tsh and elevated free t3 and elevated free t4 uh the di for diagnostic criteria we use birch what what of see point scale which is mainly used in adults but sometimes it can be used in pediatrics as well the specific antibody uh, associated with hyperthyroidism are tsh receptor antibodies so what we say is trab as well and you will give anti thyroid drugs that is carbimazole propanol beta blockers propanolol to reduce the autonomic activity and steroids or uh, usually we give prednisone for anti inflammatory reaction and it also inhibits uh, the t4 production so this is uh, just the diagnostic criteria uh, for thyroid storm is given in nelson now you have to interpret these thyroid results this is the answer key you just have to mix and match very high tsh low free t4 uh, and low t4 so you'll we'll give 10 seconds for each question a normal tsh low t4 and normal free t4 is expected in which condition everything low low tsh low free t4 low t4 now everything high high tsh high free t4 high t4 last you have low tsh with high t4 and high free t4 so again just 10 seconds to fill up your answers yeah see the answer key there <clears throat> it's like match the following so i think you have matched it perfectly i'll take the answers so very high tsh low free t4 low t4 is seen in primary hypothyroidism as already taken by vandana ma'am and ravindra sir normal tsh with a low free low t4 and normal free t4 again it was taken by ravindra sir so it would be seen in thyroglobulin thyroxine uh, thyroglobulin binding uh, deficiency low free t4 low tsh and low t4 would be seen in secondary or central hypothyroidism everything high it's go it goes in favor of thyroid hormone resistance 
and low TSH, high T4 and high free T4, as seen in our previous case as well, is seen in thyrotoxicosis or Graves' disease. So we move to our next question. So we have done uh, thyroid scintigraphy uh, in this patient. Technetium scan was done. Uh, you have to tell the condition A, B, and the next question is you have to name the radiological scan of choice for diagnosis of thyroid dyshormonogenesis. Take the answers. So this you can see that the uptake is taken by salivary glands only. There is no thyroid gland uptake. So this is a case of thyroid disagenesis. Here, the normal position of thyroid is in the midline here, but it is lying uh, at an upper position of the normal uh, expected position. So it is ectopic thyroid. And uh, for uh, thyroid hormone dysgenesis, we'll do a perchlorate discharge test. This is just the procedure. Just So you have to do a perchlorate discharge test. Moving to our next station. A 10-year-old boy presented with painless increasing size of both the testes. His height is less than third centile and he has just grown two centimeter per in the last year. So it's a poor growth velocity along with short stretcher. The weight is preserved and it is on the 75th centile and he has a delayed bone age that is seven years at a chronological age of 10 years. So name one condition where precocious puberty with short stretcher and delayed bone age is seen. What investigations you would like to order in this case? What is the cause of testicular enlargement in this particular condition? And uh, tell us the management. So very interesting phenomena. Thyroid can cause both precocious puberty and delayed puberty. Previous case was delayed puberty. Now something different. So we'll take the answers. I think everybody is ready with the answers. So uh, this is a primary hypothyroidism with peripheral or pseudo precocious puberty, a syndrome, a specific syndrome which is called von Wig Grumbach syndrome. You will order free T4 and TSH to confirm hypothyroidism and an LH, FSH and testosterone to rule out, uh, to confirm peripheral precocity. You will expect a high FSH and slightly raised LH with a low testosterone. And the phenomena responsible for this is molecular mimicry. That is uh, TSH and FSH have a common alpha subunit. So if high TSH that causes high FSH because of this common uh, alpha subunit. So that gives rise to testicular enlargement in boys. And in girls, it gives rise to breast development, ovarian cysts, and sometimes isolated vaginal bleeding as well. But the catch here is short stretcher and delayed bonage. And again, the treatment of choice would be thyroxine replacement at uh, a dose of one to two microgram per kg per day. So we are coming to our last station. Uh, a newborn baby on day seven found to have a newborn screening TSH of 256 international units per ml. Baby is having jaundice, excessive sleepiness, lethargy, and poor feeding. Uh, so you have to counsel the parents regarding further management. So we'll take the uh, answer. So uh, whenever uh, in DNB OSCE or uh, in postgraduate OSCE as well, whenever you are as to do the counseling, first of all, we have to introduce ourselves that uh, that you are a doctor or uh, whether you are an MD doctor or whatever. And then you have to congratulate the patient for having a baby. And uh, then you have to talk about the physiology of the particular condition, then about the pathology, followed by treatment and specific advices. And in the last, you have to ask whether they have any questions or not. So we'll start with... Uh, the physiology of thyroid gland that in most babies with congenital hypothyroidism, uh, the thyroid gland may not reach its proper place in the neck during development, or it may be very small or even missing completely as uh, in cases of thyroid dysgenesis. Usually there is no family history of congenital hypothyroidism, but in 
certain uh, percentage, 20 to 20% uh, who are having thyroid dyshormonogenesis, we can have a family history of uh, sibling affected with hypothyroidism. So you need to tell them that uh, if it's thyroid hormone dis hormonogenesis, uh, their second baby is having a slightest chance of uh, having a congenital hypothyroidism. Then we have to tell them the treatment modalities. Already we have done uh, biochemical investigations, but to prove our diagnosis, we need to do imaging and USG. The next question comes, are they safe? So we have to tell them that thyroid scans are very safe and they can give us the information about the type of hypothyroidism and whether it's likely to be permanent or not. Then we have to tell them that uh, children with congenital hypothyroidism are able to do all activities normally as long as the treatment is taken regularly and in appropriate doses. And the treatment is just a medication by mouth that has to be given once a daily, once daily. So what the body is not making, we are giving it through an oral medication. But important is to tell them that they should start their treatment promptly. As already told that 14 days is the lead time. So as early as possible, we have to start the treatment to prevent further mental retardation. Again, then, uh, then comes uh, that uh, whether treatment is effective or safe. So we have to tell them that it is safe and effective. If taken in appropriate doses, it should not result in any side effects. It has to be given every day orally in the morning. They can crush the tablet because syrup suspension is not available in India. So they can crush the tablet, either mix it with breast milk or directly put the crushed powder in the baby's mouth and breastfed. So whatever they feel comfortable, they can do. The child can have all the uh, usual immunizations or medical treatment needed for other conditions. She doesn't need to eat any specific diet because of hypothyroidism. Certain medications like iron and calcium supplements may interfere with the absorption of thyroxine. So it is advisable that they should keep a gap of at least four to six hours between these supplements and the thyroxine dose. And in the end, you need to ask their doubts if they have any. And then you just need to tell them when they do need to come for the next follow-up. So thank you. If you have any doubts, you can ask. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Ankita, for the uh, excellent uh, presentation. Please note the aim of ASCII: fifty percent is very easy, twenty-five percent is little tough, ten to twenty-five percent is beyond the reach. So you have to work hard, do ASCIIs every week so that it will be easy. Let me ask few more ASCII: one or two within one second. Suppose hypothyroidism child coming with the calf hypertrophy. What do you call that? Think over. Like that, so many questions can be asked. So we don't have a time. Coker debris, Smelian syndrome. So, Raghupati, sir, you want to tell anything, sir? We are coming to just last one or two minutes about the question and answers. Uh, I was saying that uh, even thyroid mm -hmm. can be challenging and uh, uh, we may be caught can you see my slide? Uh, yes, sir. Now. Okay. These slides I have already shown you. Yes, sir. And uh, we should not wait till this stage. And uh, this is an ectopic thyroid, which you can see. It's already been shown. This is an extreme case of dyshormonogenesis in the newborn period. I mean, by this time, it was actually three or four months. And uh, if newborn screening is done, this could have been avoided and uh, the treatment could have been better. And uh, this is an extreme case. This is a boy who has completed his 12th standard exam and he is 18 years old, 17 years old. And sir, uh, your slide is still late first, sir. You should go to fifth slide. You can't see? No, you are showing the uh, slide show is not visible, sir. We are able to see only first slide. You have to go to slide show. Or you go to slide five. You are telling about the slide five. My here it is moving. Uh, yeah, no problem, sir. We are able to see small photo of. Uh, yeah, you can tell, sir. Small photo we are able to see in the. And this boy, he said, is seventeen years old, 
and he came with short stature and I was horrified to see that he is a case of hypothyroidism. But to my surprise, he is a very good student and uh, he has done quite well in his exam and he even passed his exam also. So we do have uh, some challenging situations like this. And the next case that I want to show is one which uh, I was seeing in my clinic and I remember Amarnath was with me when he was doing the training and this girl was diagnosed as autoimmune hypothyroidism and I had started treatment and the parents came and said, ever since this treatment was started, the child is sleeping all the time. I couldn't believe it. But fortunately, it was in the evening. I saw this child. I don't know whether you can see the slide, but uh, she was sleeping in front of me. Then I said, this is myasthenia gravis. You know, both are uh, autoimmune conditions. And uh, this is a very, very rare thing uh, to happen. But uh, as I said, we need to be aware of all these problems. And yes, sir. Now visible, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a, a potential ASCII for uh, you. They can ask most common uh, other autoimmune diseases, type 1 diabetes. You should know. And uh, I wanted to congratulate and thank, sir. He showed me, based on growth chart, child was coming for the hypothyroidism. He diagnosed diabetes based on only growth chart, loss of weight. So please try to learn from the professors. Just by growth chart, you can diagnose many diseases. Thank you what very much, sir. Is the, with the treatment, they bloom and blossom, you know. And it's a pleasure to see these children improving with the treatment. And uh, if you start treatment early, they'll blossom from the beginning itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So we'll go to last just one minute. We'll look over the questions, what has been asked in the last few years. Can you stop uh, this thing screen sharing, sir? Yeah. Where is it? Thank you, sir. Hope uh, my screen is visible. No, Dr. Amar, your sir's screen is still visible. Your screen is not. <coughs> sir, you have to close the screen. Oh, Don't okay. minimize it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, now your screen is visible. Is it visible? It, uh, now it's visible. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm DNB examiner also. Please note, whenever you're writing query answer, please write uh, in side headings. Please use three to four flowcharts, diagrams, maximum tables you should write. Then only you'll get good marks. So it should not be monotonous. This is from the Nelson developmental physiology. The questions are like synthesis and its derangements. What are the changes seen in thyroid hormone uh, levels around birth? Describe the silent features of neonatal thyroid screening program. This is most important. It's available in net. You can uh, download that is ISPE guidelines, national guidelines. Interpretation of thyroid function test. This is told by already Dr. Ravindra Kumar sir and also we had ASCII. So hypothyroidism, commonly diagnosis, endemic cretinism. This is outdated. We don't use cretinism at all now. Congenital hypothyroidism, etiopathology of congenital hypothyroidism, neonatal thyroid screening, again, causes clinical features, acquired hypothyroidism, discuss synthesis of thyroid hormone, discussed by madam already, common causes of acquired hypothyroidism in 12-year-old girl, Discuss brief clinical manifestation of laboratory diagnosis. So screening and treatment of congenital hypothyroidism. Thyroiditis. Briefly list the various thyroid function tests. Describe clinical presentation and management of autoimmune thyroiditis. So these are the from the goiter, management of puberty goiter. Once there was a question on uh, grades of goiter. So management of pubertal goiter and goitrogenic hypothyroidism. They can ask question on hyperthyroidism, childhood hyperthyroidism. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I thank all the 
panelist especially ispe for giving this chance to me over to jayvinder yeah yeah thank you dr amanna so i thank you uh, all the panelists all the participants for their active participation and many questions were asked so i thank you ayla ma'am vandana ma'am ravinder sir dr mahesh dr ankita dr deep sika dr pooja and dr disha have done very good job and i thank you dr raghupati sir for the teaching uh, lessons sir has a huge experience and he gives us the life changing lessons in between and uh, dr amarnath for the persistent hard work uh, his passion which has brought life in this pet program and we hope to see you again on 21st june 23 for the second pep session yeah okay. next session will be very interesting it's diagnostics in pediatric endocrinology so don't miss uh, now i request raghupati sir and uh, final remarks from the speakers anything i was very pleased to see the number of uh, participants as 143 at one time i don't know whether it was higher <laughs> sir one went up to 150 sir One fifty, yeah. One fifty. Yeah. And, uh, and around because it's gone all India, and uh, I am very very happy to see the interest in uh, pediatric endocrinology. And uh, I hope you found this session very useful. I congratulate, sir. He cancelled his OPD and he came for the class. See the passion. So we are very young. We don't want to leave all our work, but being professor at this age. we should learn the passion and love so see the the blooming of the flowers and all so that is the vision of professor he want all of us to be as like him and more than him thank you very much for your blessing sir i thank dr dr ankita for hard work dr ravindra kumar dr mahesh and uh, jayvinder aila madam everyone especially i thank all the participant we wish you all the best you should come with good colors gold medalist more than that treating the patients spending the time with the patient hmm? having active interaction see the theronom see the medicines huh? see all signs go to the uh, lab see the x ray see the ultrasound that's what my professor used to say so for each patient you should go to the laboratory discuss with the radiologist uh, differentiate between testis and ovary see the thyroid what is a normal picture technician scan like that so it should be a uh, like a multi tasked approach with all the specialist I once again thank everyone, especially Ria and RX events. Though there was a small uh, technical glitch in the beginning, they have done very well. We have posted the uh, the Telegram link in the Q and A session and also in the chat box. Later, you can contact me, uh, Dr. Jayvinder. Once again, thank you all. See you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.